you know, probably half of the work came together pretty quickly. And I'm excited about showing in this space with you and showing uh, you for the first time, having a solo show in Orange Park. It's exciting. I like the vibe of the space and the community. Okay. Um, I want to start kind of like, I want to start with the, the little backstory about your work and um, your practice and how you came to what we're looking at now. Because you actually have a degree in photography, and you started there, and then you went to grad school to study studio art. Can you explain briefly how you came to using the material of books, particularly encyclopedias, and now you're kind of expanding into medical textbooks and law books for very specific projects, but what was the first instance of you working with that material and why? The first time using law books, I uh, made it, I'm sorry, it's like I'm like jumping ahead. <laughs> using encyclopedias, um, I worked with, I made a portrait series that was based upon Victor's 48 portraits. And when he made his portrait series, the reference images were from the encyclopedia. So I just got a hold of a set, a hold of, a set of encyclopedias from the same year, which was 1972, and made my portrait series, and then just became this continuation of, of using the material and like discovering what I could do with it visually. And it was just really this act of breaking, breaking the material down, kind of deconstructing it, desecrating it, and putting it back together to, um, to create something visually about what was going on in terms of representation, lack of representation within, within the, uh, the textbooks. And so you did this, this new series of portraits, but then how were you pushing, pushing to get to this? Um, and also, just to briefly describe that series, he's talking about 48 portraits. His version is called 48 Portraits Underexposed, and they're literally portraits. So, can you explain how you made them? Like, you took the paper, you pulped it. I just removed the paper from the encyclopedias, pulped the paper to make sheets of paper to make prints on, and printed images of 24 men and 24 women who could have been represented in the encyclopedia that year that weren't. And they're underexposed, so you have to sit with it for a second to actually see the images. And it's, it's really kind of a play on like that fight for, for visibility. And so that's how that came about. Um, and then I wasn't sure what I was gonna do after that because I made that in grad school. And <clears throat> she had a conversation with Mark Bradford he asked me what I was going to do next, and I was like, I don't know, and he told me, he just encouraged me to keep working with the material, mm -hmm. and to try to you know, dig deeper and, and discover something within the material, and, and that's when I, you know, just started ripping the covers off, and then soaking them in water, and, and skinning the covers uh, from the books, and just, I laid them out, and started sewing them together, and yeah, they just became this. It was just kind of like this, just a discovery by like just by tearing the material apart, not knowing what I was going to come to. And visually, on the inside, of it, they they were beautiful, uh, much more beautiful, I think, than the than the outside of the covers themselves. Which is I don't know. There's that there's that cliche thing of like, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. And then, because <laughs> I've been, I've had some books where I just they weren't interesting on the inside, and I was just setting them to the side, and I said you know I should mess with that and see what happens with it, and they kind of, they're actually there were on these these here, and on the outside they're the Burgundy books, the Burgundy encyclopedias, the Britannica that just aren't very appealing, but on the inside they were wonderful. So you're using both inside covers and outside covers. Yeah. So what you see is the inside of the covers, and the actually the outside of the covers is towards the canvas. You can't see those; those, those are hidden. Um, I haven't done anything where you can actually see, well, other than the piece with the spines, where you can actually see the outside, the visible outside of the, the original form of the material. 
Um, I want to talk about, we have in this exhibition a room in the back, and it has an installation in there called Black Hole. Mm -hmm. And I actually saw an image in a Google search from you um, of that piece from when you were in grad school. And this is the first time that we've like shown it publicly or whatever. Was that what we see in the, that back room, which is just the spines of the book like falling out of the wall? Was that before you started making these artworks? Was that after? Was it the same time? <coughs> that was before. That was, I made that during grad school. That was pretty early on. And it was the first time I had sewn the material together. And I just removed all the information. It was more about this idea of, you know, there's a lot of information there. I won't dismiss that, but there's a lot of information that's not there. So it was kind of like this play on just like removing it all. And just like thinking about the void that, that exists. <clears throat> but I made that, that was only up for a couple of weeks. Because I installed that in my studio and there was a, a um, the fire, the fire marshals came to do an inspection and they told me that it was against fire code so I had to take it out of the wall and patch the hole in the wall. So it was only visible for like a couple of weeks and it's exciting to, to be able to, to share that piece again. The material so far with the encyclopedias started from this 48 portrait series inspired initially by Gerhard Richter and Lydia Stone. Um, I'd like for you to explain to us why specifically you're choosing to use the encyclopedia. Like go more into <clears throat> why this material versus just any book. I think from, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I think with this book, um, well, even personally, thinking back from a, an early age of doing research and using this material as like an acceptable form of material for doing research, um, like writing papers in school, like junior high, and that sort of thing, using that information and it, it being acceptable, <clears throat> but it's widely, it's a widely recognizable source of information, source of material, and, you know, I was thinking about the, the material itself and the information, just like being highly respected and thinking about it, even though it's highly respected and there's a lot of information that's usable, but there's something wrong with it, there's something flawed that, you know, there's the information that's left out, thinking about who creates the information, who compiles the information, who puts it together, and who leaves out information, the information that's left out intentionally, mm -hmm. and really bringing that to light and having discourse around that. Um, and also really being <coughs> a reference for different structures that exist <coughs> and that, that control the things. And I'm just like the, the negative aspect of those, those entities that, that exist. Um, you just won the Joyce Alexander Wee Artist Prize. That was really exciting for you. Are you still excited about that? I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I, it was totally unexpected and it's nice to just, you know, I guess just to back up a little bit, when I was finished in grad school, um, there was someone who visited my studio and she asked to purchase a piece from me. And I was just like, she was like, how much do you want for it? And I was like, I'm not sure. And she goes, well, isn't this why you're doing this? I was like, not really, I'm, I'm making it because I love making the work and I'm making it for a, a particular reason. And uh, you, you, then again, that does only go so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the prize, I wasn't expecting it whatsoever and it, and it just kind of, enables me to to push forth with the work and you know not really think about you know the basic needs and necessities that that, that that have to go they're just a part of life you know i have a family i have two kids and you know really enables me to just like go in the studio and co 
continue to make my work without really thinking about, um, you know, taking care of the basic needs of life. Uh, so that it's very exciting, and just to think about um, how the work is being, I guess, maybe respected in some sense that there's you know some recognition. Uh, I think I never would have thought they would have gone this far when I went to grad school. I just finished grad school. In 2012, and when I moved from the Midwest to the Bay Area, I thought that I was going to teach, and uh, it just, it's the path has just become something totally, totally different, which is wonderful. I'm very excited about what I do. Um, I'm excited about making the work and uh, sharing, you know, what what is in the work. So I, I'm, I will also be excited. Um, so thinking about like the future, you kind of mentioned that just a little bit. Over the summer, you did the Recology residency that's up in San Francisco, and you made a three-dimensional piece. You did like a sculpture in a sense with it looked like a cement block, but it's really the paper that's blocked. Talk about like ideas that you have beyond the works that we see here, these two-dimensional things that hang on the wall. Like, what else are you thinking about? And in 2015, going forward, we know that you're doing a site-specific installation in New York and other, like, what other ideas are you considering in this sort of three-dimensional space? Is that something that you want to keep exploring? I want to explore the three-dimensional piece was very interesting and I, and I liked it because it was, it pertained to this work. You know, the material comes from the same material. Uh, Can you explain like how you made it and what it is for people who may not be familiar? So the piece that I made, I, it was titled uh, Home Passage Carpet. And early, so at Recology, you source material that's just, that's dumped and you collect the material and, and make work from that material. And I, early on, I found this beautiful wooden crate, shipping crate, and I pulled it out, brought it into the studio, think, thinking I would just use it to use it to ship something in it, maybe work. And I, I wanted to go back and pull more material, pull more paper, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I just, the night before I pulled the paper, the night before, because I actually had someone come to come to the studio to help me do the pulping because they have this machine that's called a, a Hollander beater to, uh, to pulp paper and I can pulp like five gallons of paper pulp like within 15 minutes. So it was like, as before, I was just using a household blender <laughs> <laughs> and it took a lot of time to do that. Um, so I was thinking about the material or thinking about the crate and thinking about shipping and this, the term of term in and of itself and thinking about how it's used, you know, shipping, you think about shipping it just comes from the word ship, you know, to like move, you know, cargo on a ship from one place to another. It was you know, the early means of really getting things, uh, moving things a long distance and it's also used in like shipping things by train or by air. But um, <clears throat> something just came across me and I got it on the internet and I started looking for terms that were associated with uh, slavery and I came up, I found this glossary of terms and one term that I came, that I saw was called home passage. And so it's basically the, the, the route that ships took back, you know, east, back to Europe. And I thought about, um, you know, I was thinking about the encyclopedias and thinking about this idea of like, you know, the information that's left out. And it being, being very specific and one-sided, so it's like this idea of like destroying this information and like putting it back in a crate and like sending it back east, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's how that came up, came about. And then basically, what I just I did was pulp the paper and I we were dumping it into this crate, and it was like a lot of pulping. Mm -hmm. I think we spent all day pulping, and the crate wasn't as full as I wanted it to be. <laughs> so I started taking books and burying it in the pulp to like displace it as much as possible. And then 
something interesting happened because there was like making this this like soup like materials like it, it ended up looking like concrete and then I was taking the books themselves and burying them in its own material and uh, I don't know I can't explain Visually, it's just very interesting. I think the process was very interesting, and making that piece was interesting in the sense of like it was a break from doing this mm -hmm. and doing something different. Um, but to talk about a little bit more about what I, I guess for 2015, um, I've worked predominantly with uh, encyclopedias, with the exception of Bad Practice, which was used from medical books. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to pick up a huge amount of law books. Actually, around 400 law books. And I think, you know, with what's going on now, that it, it's very appropriate. It's appropriate from, you know, a personal standpoint and from, you know, you know just the things that are going on, the current, current things that are going on. I think it'll be very fitting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Black White Thread, <laughs> why that title for the exhibition? Hmm. You, cause that's your title. You came up with that. It is my title. <laughs> well, I guess you basically the, the thread that I use in the material is black and white thread. Um, but it's deeper than that. My, my father's black, my mother's white, and you know, just, uh, so growing up, the different things that I that I uh, experienced coming from that background, and just, you know, basic things that, that dealing with race. Um, so it's I don't know. There was this literal thing of like black and white thread that I use in the material, and then it's deeper. So it's like. Kind of intentional but not intentional. Uh, it's just very interesting. I kind of, I feel like the work that I do when I make my work, it comes, it, it's very instinctual. And then once I'm in the process of doing it, like it's like okay, like these different ideas that come up, they just fit with what I'm doing. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right here. <laughs> There was, there was no color at all. Uh, so a lot of people thought it was concrete. Um, yeah, so it was just like a gray, like a grayish color. Does anyone else have any questions? No. You, you never expounded on that kind of the story from uh, photography. That? <clears throat> you know, when I uh, when I first started making, um, I had a camera in my hands, and there was just something interesting I found fascinating about just with making images. You know, looking through the viewfinder and like exploring the world, like looking through a lens, and then making prints, um, and then I started to. So initially, I was just interested in the camera itself, and then as I started making work, I was like, you know, I have I had all these things that I was dealing with, you know, personally, and I wasn't really sure what to do with those things. And I quickly discovered that I could that those things could be in my work. Um, and then I think there got to a point to where, when I was in undergrad, I was doing some things through video and also some things um, sculpturally, and I. I felt like, you know, stepping up away from the camera was, to me, I felt like it was a little bit restrictive, and I could process the ideas a little bit more. Uh, 
uh, through working with different materials. Um, and I, I don't know. The greatest thing that I liked about you know working with the camera, I enjoyed black and white film photography and being in a dark room and kind of having that physical hands-on interaction with the, with the process of, of making the prints. Um, so this is just, it just becomes something much more just working with the material, like being able to think things out. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think it just opened up, opened up the parameters a bit, a bit more. Initially, I did it, but I, yeah, it's, I, I think of them as paintings. Um, and I guess, you know, personally, I wouldn't say, I, when I was working on them initially, I didn't think I'm making a painting. Um, but I've had a number of people come up to me and they say, how do you apply the paint? Like, what is it? What's your process? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, and there's no, I mean, I do paint the edge of the canvases. Uh, they're predominantly paint, the edges of the canvas are painted black. And sometimes the material will have holes in them, so I'll paint, you know, the under part of the canvas back. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, I can naturally say that just because they're on canvas, they're it's a painting. But yeah, and that it never fails that someone every now and then ask how the painting was, how paint was applied. So yeah, we'll go with that. Can I get back to my question? Okay. Um, so do you think it's more difficult? That too. I mean, especially that piece back there in the back corner. Um, Lots of people think that's a quilt print. They, they yeah. do. Uh, yeah, so I think some of them look more like, well, you know, a few of them look like quilts more than others. And, you know, that's an interesting thing too. And, and using a sewing machine, so I sew these materials together. Um, which, you know, I'm, I'm not. I don't mind that they, they have that aspect. I think that's important. Uh, that's a quali uh, an important quality to the work that I guess, you know, thinking of the existence of, of work, artwork in general, and like how it makes its way into certain sectors. You know, some artworks do and some don't. So I think that's important. Yeah, if that makes sense, without saying too much. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I have a few more questions. Okay. Um, about the painting aspect, because you are working with all the materials on the boat with the boat covers, and you found a way to utilize lots of these uh, older encyclopedias that had these really beautiful gold leaf inks on the front, but all the letters and the wording is in this gold leaf. So you're kind of applying that back onto these surfaces in a painterly sort of way. Um, will you ever start painting on these? Because you kind of, with the gold leafing, you extract it, and then you reapply it in certain areas. I wonder if paint will ever become a part of this, other than just the colors and things. You brought about an interesting idea. So, yeah, the you know the gold leaf. I was I discovered that by well, I knew that gold leaf was kind of part, but just the way that it felt, it was falling off the material, and I just started collecting it and reapplying it. But I hadn't actually thought about doing more of that. But I think uh, if I were to do that, it would have to be because the amount of gold leaf that I've been using. It's just based upon the amount of material that's there. Mm -hmm. But it would be interesting to like do more of that, push that more. Because um, naturally I would say that it would have to have, there would have to be a specific reason mm -hmm. to, to use that and apply it. But I guess as long as it, so it's naturally there and if I were to use more of that, it would be interesting to push that more and have a more visible, um, so that's a possibility. <laughs> Is that a, are you imagining me? 
I think that, <laughs> I, there's, there's one piece, we Instagrammed a photo today, and it's you in the photo, and you're applying cold lead oh, yeah. on the title piece called Black White Thread, which is in the other room there. And people come in the gallery all the time, and they ask, you know, about your painting style. And I have to explain the colors are really organic. Let's talk about the construction of your pieces. How do you put together, you know, you look at hematoma, which is there, you know, and it's right down the middle of the grid, black and blue. Mm -hmm. You have rearrange, which lots of people think of as a quilt. Even this with the colors, are, are, it seems to me that the color is a, also a very important part of the conversation because you use that to construct how it's going to look, how it's going to turn out. So how do you make those judgments? Is it based on the materials? Are you looking at everything in the studio all at the same time? Or are you putting things together, specifically grouping books, saying this will be one work, and then another group of books as another work? You know, early on, I was when I was making these, you know, the, the size was really determined by the amount of books that were in a set of books. Um, Hematoma is actually from two book, well, two sets of books, and I had them together. And they they did they looked good together, and by themselves they were they would have come out to this odd arrangement. They were I guess I didn't feel like it was like symmetrically not so appealing. So I made, started placing them together. And they worked out well, um, and rearrange. That came together because they're just those shapes are naturally that way, the way that the books were constructed. Um, and you know, this piece right here was the first time that I had. A lot of the pieces are in a grid-like format, and that kept coming up. And with this one here, I just kind of wanted to do something. So this was like the first piece where I did actually, uh, you know, rip the covers down into small pieces. So I just cut them down into quarters and layered them together. And it, was just, it just became more about experimenting with, you know, the aesthetic and pushing it more rather than I just come up with something new. Um, so about the, the thing about the process, the 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 initial big part of the process of it's about breaking the material down. And when I'm putting it back together, it's kind of, that's when it becomes more fun. So I guess like tearing it down is like putting this like, uh, it's like this cathartic process, mm -hmm. putting that energy into deconstructing the material and putting it back together is a, a, a bit more playful. Um, it's a great exhibition so far. Yes. Yeah, so there are no more Questions. Oh, you, there are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe talk about the format a little bit, but um, you know, the social commentary that happens in books, especially in the Bay Area, um, and what happens with the inside of the book when you write the inside of the book? I've done, I've done a little bit of paper pulp inside of the book. Um, I've done a little bit of I've done a little bit of paper pulping, and a lot of the other materials I just I put them into recycling. Um, and it's interesting, like, I, I've had a couple people that come up to me. And are extremely bothered that I'm <laughs> destroying these books. Uh, really? Yeah. Like, what do they say? Um, well, just you know, you know, growing up, you know, from an early on, from an early on standpoint, of like, yeah. you know, they, you get in trouble for drawing in the book or writing in the book, yeah. and, and and doing those sorts of things to it. So there was, you know, there've been a couple of people that are like were very bothered by that because I guess they were conditioned. So like keep the book very neat and clean. Um, after I made a few of these, and then and then I went to get more sets of books. I kind of at first I felt bad about it, and then I don't know. I got over it pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because these books are like family heirlooms. They like get, they get passed down. Yeah, you know from like. Generate like your grandparents give it to your parents, then your parents give it to you, and it's like this family heirloom, this 
set of books. Yeah, actually, I, I attempted to get a set that had been in the family for like five generations. And uh, that had came up for sale? Yeah. He wanted way too much money for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told him what I was going to do to them, and he, he said that it sounded interesting. Um, he wouldn't come down anymore with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what was the price? I'm just curious. I think it may have been like around $2,000 for one set of books. Wow. And um, there were a set of books that were leather bound. And I've worked on a, I've had a few sets of those, and they're 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 from 1911. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have another. I have a set in my studio. They're not they're not leather, but they're um, they're from 1911. So it's interesting while working with this material that's really old. Uh, <clears throat> but for the most part, a lot of the books that I come across, people can't get rid of them. They say no one wants to take them. Libraries won't take them. So it's interesting how that that shift has changed in terms of like the book being like you know respected and, and well taken care of to mm -hmm. to even ending up at the dump. Mm -hmm. And I probably had like six sets of books at the residency that were just put out to the trash. Mm -hmm. say artists, whether they want to be political or not, are really good at these things. Because always, the only thing we know about history is what we know to write and write about it. Mm -hmm. Those art is really depicting, like, if you look at the life of, you know, I would love to read that there were the slaves who were forced to do that stuff, and to Cardinals who did that. So you kind of get a sense. So when you're destroying these books, to me, I don't know, the social commentary, even on the book you want, even on the, the, the value of Besides being the thought, so how much of that takes over this kind of idea where it's okay actually at this point to just make these books again and be a witness to how we feel about discovering history now more? Does that make sense? It does make sense. I think, I guess one of my ways, I don't know, I'll try to answer this, but just getting past that when I said, you know, at first it was difficult to, when I, decided I was like, going to continue this process and destroying the books. But I, you know, really, I, I thought about, you know, when I did, when I made images of 24 men and 24 women, like how I had to go to very, like, specifically to, you know, books that were like, Encyclopedia of African American History. And where it wasn't, like this information just wasn't in these books that everyone is that everyone recognizes, um, and then it was really difficult finding twenty four women. Finding because what I did was just I would go up to other source materials and I scanned the portraits from those and I used those. Um, <clears throat> so you know when I grew up, those I, I grew up in a small town in in Indiana, and when I went on the book like to the library or like. Either a, either a school or the public library, I don't remember seeing that source material. It was just this. So I guess it's really like kind of getting to that. It's like you know, there is important things there, but you know what about you know the things that aren't there? Um, yeah. um, I'm in another piece. <clears throat> Was titled 736 Portraits, where I removed all the, the formal portraits or formal images of white figures and black figures to like pull them out of the book and, and juxtapose them to show like the offset of representation. And um, of the you know the 736, there were only this was in uh, from books in 1972. There were you know, 13 African Americans. Um, and then you know a number of those were actually from a section in the book that said that was titled African Americans. Um, rather than, so you know, Martin Luther King was in there, Frederick Douglass was in there, rather than being under K or D, 
in that section of the encyclopedia if they were. So that was, yeah. So, yeah. And when you think about that, it, it's, it makes it easy to destroy the material. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I think the reason, you know, I'm, I'm getting law books to work with law books next and thinking about law books, who, who law was initially written for. Um, you know, it wasn't, it was, you know, not written for anyone who, who wasn't white or even, or a man. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. That's, that's interesting, like the, the, violent as, the, the violent part of, of tearing the books down. So when you're, I don't know, when you're out in society, like you're expected to be calm and not enraged. So I'm, I'm able to like get that out when I'm working on the material. Uh, but I don't know. When I, when I present the work, I don't want it to be about that. I think a lot of my earlier work was done that way. Um, because I want it to be received and I want it to be, I want it to reach like a vast audience so that there is a, so that a conversation can be a hell rather than coming off as pissed off or ang angry. Like I want it to be approached when you see me from across the room and talk about the work. Any more questions? Um. I did want to ask one more thing, and then we'll wrap it up. The material is very delicate, uh, and you are handling it um, in a very non-delicate kind of way, and then you're sewing it together. Even when you talk about this set that you have in your studio now from 1911, it's it's paper, and paper is just a fragile material. You know, there's a you have to go through great efforts to conserve paper. How are you, how do you make it work when, you know, especially when I look at bad practice, it is so fragile to me when I see it with my eyes, even though it's very, like, aggressive and it takes the whole, you know, just on this, it completely takes over the room, but I can tell that when you're working with it, some of the sheets are thin, how do you sew that together? Like, how are you making this work? Some of it's not as fragile as others. I mean, that was, that one was a real pain. Uh, but it, once I, I think one of the reasons why I put it on the stretcher bars and put it on either on canvas or I put them on um, plywood, mm -hmm. it gives it, you know, some support to where it's easy to handle and it's not as delicate. Yeah, that was one of the other reasons why I chose to display them that way. Uh, but sometimes there's just a lot of cursing that goes <laughs> when, I, when I'm sewing them together. Have you like destroyed a work that was in progress because you mishandled it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a piece that we. Um, Actually, Sarah was helping me sew, and some it was a leather piece, and some of the leather was much thinner than the rest of it. And as I was handling, it just kept tearing. And we just actually, she decided that I had to leave that material out because that meant that part of the material out. Because um, I wanted to use all of it, and I was trying to make it as large as possible from that one set of books, and mm -hmm. just that's actually. There was a lot of uh, frustration in that piece. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. It wasn't thrown out, but it was sized down. Extremely sized down. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
So no more questions. Thank you so much, Sam.